So in these four uh, reasons, for sexual purity, is God will punish sexual immorality. The second reason, because our call is not to uncleanliness but to holiness. Thirdly, the reason for sexual purity is because to reject God's call for sexual purity is not rejecting God but rejecting God himself. Fourthly, is because we've been given the Holy Spirit who empowers us. And then Paul wants to finish with this uh, verses, living a quiet life before God. We should live a life of increasing love. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Because of time, let me just uh, quickly um, summarize this place. You see, if I'm living in sin as a Christian, do you know that my participation in a church affects everybody? Not because I'm the pastor. You sitting in the pew, your Christian walk affects everybody around you. But let's say you're living in sin. If you live in sin, it's obviously you have missed the step of loving. And then the other thing is, if I'm living in sin, that means I'm involved with somebody and I'm really blinding them to be in that sin with me. So then where is the love? You see, I can tell you, in my struggles, everything that comes to me, I turn around and said, how could I let down God's people? Because guess what? I am called to love one another. You cannot genuinely love God and love one another if your life is still sunk in a sinful lifestyle. And this is where there are a lot of problem. You know, people who have just gone about the wrong way with a lot of things. But anyway, I just want to say that we should live a life of increasing love. And the way you live a life of increasing love is simply this. You turn away from a sinful lifestyle. You have a checklist of all your lifestyle and you mark out the area where you know you're not living for God. You repent of it, you turn to God, and you seek forgiveness of those that you might have defrauded by your sinful lifestyle. If you don't do that, Satan may keep you happy, and you may think you're all right, but I'll tell you what, there'll be a day of reckoning, because that shows your rejection of God. And then Paul does not stop there. Verse 11, he said, we should live a life of work. You know, many times I find people crying, oh, you know, I don't have this, I'm really struggling with this, I'm really struggling with that. Usually I have found they do not want to work. They've got a very poor uh, way to, uh, to earn a living. They do nothing in that area to find good work, to work hard and all that. Because I know as a Christian, God will supply all my needs according to his will. That means he will also supply work and expect me to be diligent and vigilant and hardworking. And that's how God will supply my needs. So whenever I see somebody decrying poverty, usually I find they are lazy. They don't want to, be, they don't want to work, but they just want to be given all good things. Paul here makes it very clear for a Christian. Remember, they were in a city, a metropolis. And city, you know, money talks. We said that, they said it then, we say to them, money talks. But then others found out, hey, you know, I can join this band of people. They really love uh, one another. So I can wiggle my way in there and then cry pain and sorrow and all this thing. And they will feed me and they will keep me. 
and not pull their own weight. Paul stops that right at the, uh, at the mouth of the church and said, we should live a life of work. That means learn to be diligent and use what God, gifts God has given you. Use your hands. So, this is something that I just want to bring to you. He says that you aspire to live a quiet life. That doesn't mean look for a hole, stay away from everybody, so that if you stay from everybody, you won't be committing any sin. That's not the idea here. He's saying how you lead your life. Remember, in a city, there's a lot of noise. There's always uh, something, somewhere, there's a big noise going on. And just people in cities, you know, people tell me that in some parts of Toronto, it's like 24 hours. There's noise all over. Five years when I was studying in Dallas, we lived very close to the city of Dallas. We were really, we were in the city of Dallas. And uh, there was a big hospital right behind us. And, and there was ambulance and sometimes shootings and all that all the time. And if you're a light sleeper, get, tell me, I'll tell you, you didn't get too much rest. So therefore you aspire to lead a quiet life. This means that we should live, uh, have an aspiration or ambition in life that we should aspire to lead a quiet life. Aspire has the thought of ambition and it's translated uh, that way in several versions of the Bible. Quiet has the thought of peace, calm, rest, and satisfaction. The quiet life contradicts the hugely successful modern attraction to entertainment and excitement. This addiction to an entertainment and excitement is damaging both spiritually and culturally. That we might say that excitement and entertainment are like a religion for many people today. This religion has a God, the self. This religion has priests, celebrities, this religion has a prophet, perpetual entertainment. This religion has scriptures, tabloids and entertainment, news and informational programs. This religion has a place of worship, amusement parks, theaters, concert halls, sport arenas. And that we could say that every television and internet connection is a little chapel. And watch how much time can be robbed from us. By those things. I'm not saying that all those things are evil, but watch where it leads your life. Verse 12 that we should walk properly toward those who are outside that they may lack nothing, so that you may lack nothing. Walk properly, that means you are called to be a light and salt in a dark and dying world. Simply that. So having said that, let me just run to you, this Thessalonian church, in finishing this message. We've gone through chapter 1 to chapter 4. First, this church that was left very quickly in an infant stage. What was the characteristic of this Thessalonian church? How did they survive in the middle of such a metropolis? with all the temptations and the allurements that was around them. Let me begin with this word, committed church. Committed church. They labored long and hard on Christ's behalf. That means they picked up on Christ's agenda and they ran with Christ's agenda. Not only that, that they were committed, they were a submitted church. They initiated and imitated the faith of their spiritual father and his associates, even in much tribulation, in much pain, they were a submitted church. They were a reproducing church, means they witnessed to their neighbors, to their friends, that they witnessed even went throughout Macedonia. They were a repentant church. They had turned from false to the true God in their salvation. They were a serving church, committed to serve God rather than uh, the wealth and mammon and prestige around them. They were a patient church. They were looking for the blessed hope in the middle of great persecution. They were an accepting church. 
they responded to the power of God's word. They were a persecuted church. We've talked about that. But don't forget, they were a stout church. What do I mean by stout church? They were standing firm. They stood their ground without compromise. Ten, they were a God-pleasing church. Eleven, loving the brethren church. Twelve, they were a praying church. Folks, do we at Upper Kings Clear Baptist Church have that much courage to follow the Thessalonian church? May God help us. May God bless us. Father, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. May we learn from your word as the Thessalonian church had learned to stand firm to be people who will be more concerned about holiness than happiness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.